How does the CA nodes compiler work? It'd be difficult to explain it without having a diagram, but <laughs> um, imagine the difference between, uh, so I don't know how much of your viewership has compiler background, but like compilers before SSA and compilers after SSA, they look quite different. SSA made a lot of things easier because it makes data flow explicit in the program. It gets rid of a lot of problems that happened because of like, oh, you're optimizing this expression and then later something overwrites one of the variables involved in this expression. So SSA gets rid of that. It shows the data flow. The C of nodes kind of does the same thing, but for effects. So like it really shows you only dependencies between instructions. So it no longer has like orders of instructions in basic blocks. So everything has to be ordered by some kind of, of dependence edge. And so it inherits the property from SSA that there is data flow edges. So you will see like a little SSA graph inside of a sea of nodes thing. And so that kind of makes sense. Like if you have a plus, the two inputs to the plus are going to be edges. Um, what the sea of nodes does is that generalizes that to both effects. So like changes, updates to memory, and also for control. Mm -hmm. So if you have a load and store in the program, they will go to memory, maybe to an object, maybe to an array or whatever those will be actual edges. So the load, the thing that represents a load is going to have an additional, not only what object or whatever field or whatever you're loading from, but also what kind of version of the world, which is your effect edge. Um, and usually loads also need to be guarded by some condition because there might be a safety condition. Mm -hmm. So the graph also has control edges. Control edges basically express the fact that some kind of code needs to check something in order to make it possible to execute something. So the C of nodes kind of generalizes SSA in that it effectively renames memory and also kind of renames control. And what that means is that the, the graph or like the code is effectively way less constrained. So there are many new legal orderings for the code. It also, so the benefit of that is that you can reorganize the code and as long as the dependencies are met, then it, it will it will compute the same thing. The the version of the code that you generate will compute the same thing. So it's definitely a generalization. It's like more graph theory. Mm -hmm. uh, and that also means that like optimizations that that sort of they're called forward data flow optimizations where you you know something about your inputs. Like imagine you have x plus zero. Since you know one input is zero, you can strength reduce that to just x. Or if you are like comparing two things and you know that they're both greater than zero, then maybe you know the outcome of the comparison. So this is something you know about the inputs and therefore you can include something about the outputs. All the four data flow problems that you would ever have, you can do them all at once. They, they all, there's no phase ordering problem for that. And that, that implies to, that applies to like branch folding. So like if you have an if and like the condition is like now known to be a constant, you can fold away the if and you can get rid of one of the branches. So uh, this is like s the most elegant thing about the sea of nodes is that you can throw all the optimizations into one big pile. You crank that, you crank the handle once. Well, actually, you crank it until a fixed point, and then the graph is like optimized. Mm -hmm. There are some caveats to that because you can have an uh, you can have an optimization that does one thing and an optimization that does the opposite, and they both are forward data flow, and then like they kind of fight. So you have to there's some tuning that you have to do, like you have to be careful that it's kind of monotonic in some way. But this is like, this is awesome. So if you're a compiler person, I think the end of the road in thinking is C of nodes. So if you haven't quite reached the enlightenment of C of nodes, <laughs> you will. <laughs> is it, how common is it among compilers at, for various languages? It is actually extremely uncommon. Okay. That's what I was I thinking. Surprising. <laughs> right. So LVM is a basically kind of like a C1 on steroids. It's a, it's a CFG-based uh, SSA compiler. It just has many, many passes. There's many uh, passes that are far beyond what, like, um, you know, Crankshaft would do or C1 would do. So LVM is actually a really awesome compiler. It just doesn't go all the way to the sea of nodes uh, enlightenment, in my opinion. So we're getting into an opinion territory, by the way. So this is not scientific <laughs> fact. We'll make sure to put a, a disclaimer on the, the show notes here. <laughs> Uh, so there's also so there's like this peak of enlightenment too, and I think uh, I think we there's something beyond that which is all the downsides to the sea of nodes, which we <laughs> we hit every one of those branches on the way down, 
So there are people on the team I know for sure to this day who think the sea of nose is the worst idea ever, and they hate me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, everybody's still friends. I mean, we have tons of respect for each other. But I definitely see the downsides too. Um, I would love to write about the upsides and downsides to the sea of nodes, mm -hmm. but just for like completeness sake, um, just not to leave people hanging. It really is not very good for speculative optimizations. And I think the Grawl people would agree with that. I have talked to Thomas again over beers many times about what the, what the drawbacks are. Uh, it requires a scheduling pass that is relatively expensive. So you have this like very relaxed graph of what the computation is. You actually need to turn that into code at some point. So you need to schedule it. And so you need to find an actual order for the code. And that order that comes out is actually a CFG. So you, so you can kind of go from a CFG into the CF nodes and then optimize and then go out and then generate code. And so like the, the rest of the back end of a compiler looks pretty much the same once you've scheduled the code. But that scheduling is relatively expensive and that scheduling can totally screw up the efficiency. So if the scheduler is bad, it can be really bad. Mm. So it can make your code worse. So if you, have, if you start with a control flow graph that's actually pretty good, and turn it in the sea of nodes, and you do something, and then you schedule it, you can end up with code that was worse than what you started with. And that can be bad. So you need to have a really smart scheduler. And so the scheduler becomes like the game where all the where all of the like smarts go. And that's like you're now in like register allocator nightmare land where if you don't understand what the scheduler does, you're gonna hate life. So <laughs> you might be like, and this is actually a problem for team dynamics because you know, somebody comes in, they want to do an optimization, they're not like fully up to speed with how the sea of nodes should work. They do an optimization, something goes wrong, maybe an edge is missing, and then the scheduler takes it and it's just like, and now right. the code is maybe bad, maybe wrong, because uh, an edge is missing or something like that. So that's a real downside, just the sort of onboarding and also just like the amount of knowledge about the system you need to have to understand what the output of this thing is going to be like. Um, I mentioned the speculative optimization. So speculative optimization, what I refer to is basically you are harvesting some kind of dynamic information that you've gathered about the program execution, which is extremely common and absolutely required for JavaScript. So you might put a guard into the code, which is like, check this condition, like this variable should be this type, or this object should have this shape. And then the implication of that check is that the code below it, everything that's dominated by that, will now get simpler. Mm. And the issue is the sea of nodes, like there's no such domination condition. I mean, there is, but it's embedded in a graph that you need to compute in a way that's expensive. And so you can't just like willy-nilly start sticking in guards and have it just do the thing magically. So that that's a problem. Um, it's a lot bigger too. It can be a lot bigger because you have a lot more edges and everything you do in compilation is going to be proportional to the size of the IR. So more edges, more nodes, more time. Mm -hmm. And so everything gets slower. So if, you're, if your IR gets 2x bigger, it's almost certainly you're going to have 2x slower compilation time. Right. So that's a problem. So usually C of nodes compilers are a lot slower than CFG compilers. So that can be an issue if you want to have like a kind of a mid-tier compiler. So I see that downside too. Um, I don't know how all this plays out in the fullness of time. I've started to think that maybe a compiler pipeline should be able to run without the sea of nodes. That was something we tried to do in V8. Many people wanted to get completely get rid of the sea of nodes in TurboFan. I don't think that's totally possible because there are many optimizations that get so much better with that, again, turning the crank all at once. Um, I don't know how this plays out in the full, fullness of time. I think the next optimizer compiler I attempt will have the sea of nodes in some phase, but mm -hmm. may not rely on it completely. And I think definitely in the beginning, in the first maybe one or two years of TurboFan, that was definitely in my head. Like this thing is going to be like sea of nodes everywhere. It's going to be this like compiler utopia. <laughs> it didn't really work. <laughs> Fair enough.